number 93. Oh 
remember Lisa and Mark. Uh, I talked to Lavina Friday. And Mark had come down sick, and he was going to get tested. So I haven't heard the results of that yet. But let's remember Mark and Lisa and Sister Lavina. She's in quarantine. Is your prayer to have Stephanie here this morning? Amen. Do you always be in prayer for Sister Cheryl? Keep in grip as well. Under you. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we bow before you this morning. And Father, we thank you so much again for just another day, another opportunity that we had to be able to come here to worship you and to look into your word. Lord, we do thank you so much for the church we've already had here today, those Sunday school lessons and those who gave them, Father, help us to continue to listen to your word and to learn more of you from it. May we grow out nearer to a better relationship with you than we had in the past. Lord, do ask that you bless each one of the prayer requests they mentioned up here today. Father, there are several that are battling and fighting through different diseases, different illnesses. Father, heal them. Give them back their strength. Lord, do be with those who perhaps lost loved ones and those who simply need wisdom or guidance. You are the director and the source of those things. We do ask that you would uh, just continue to bless this church. Help us to be a witness to you in this community. Help us to have the wisdom and the knowledge of the things we need to be doing. And also the grace and strength we need to accomplish it. Lord, do just bless this nation. God, our leaders, help them have the wisdom of how to lead the nation in a godly fashion. This nation might truly uh, turn to and seek you. Lord, you ask that you would forgive us of our sins. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Number 119. 119, first and last. Have you been to Jesus or the clean clean fight? Are you washing the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace and His son? Are you washing the blood of the Lamb? Are you washing the blood in the song with the blood of the Lamb? 
erred and were greatly misleading the people. And it didn't matter what class they were in, they, they all gotten it wrong. Uh, and so Christ's rebuke, uh, yes, he may have at times dealt specifically in one group, but as a whole, all of religious leaders of his day were causing far more harm than they were doing good for the people. Uh, they claimed to be the leaders of God's people. They claimed to be uh, religious, but in reality, they were far from it. The lawyers, uh, the Pharisees in particular, when Christ begins to address them specifically there in verse 46, with the, the first woe that he pronounces upon them. And from the very beginning, you understand that the scribes, these lawyers, uh, these experts in the law that uh, were given to Israel, or at least the self proclaimed to be experts anyway. From the very beginning, Christ's rebuke to them is geared toward the very thing that they claim to know the best. Uh, these are lawyers. They are the, the experts in the law. We get the very first thing that Christ rebukes them for. He pronounces judgment upon them for is the law and their interpretation of it. He said in verse 46 that they had taken and laid burdens grievous to be borne upon the people. And that they themselves didn't even bother to touch them. But who was one of their fingers? He said, you, uh, you shall touch not the burdens with one of your fingers. The law that God gave to Moses upon Mount Sinai, it was very extensive. It was uh, pretty much all-encompassing. It took the time to read it and to understand the laws that God gave to Moses. God gave them instructions that governed uh, essentially at every area of life. It was their legal system, but it was also a, a moral code that outlined and uh, laid down the way that Israelites should act and conduct themselves and uh, really left pretty much nothing to guess. It was all pretty well uh, laid out there in the books of Leviticus. What the lawyers had done was they had taken all the commandments that God had given them and uh, they had taken and multiplied them. They had added to them, at times taken away from them. And uh, they have built up this enormous tradition system that had become their uh, their law. And they were indeed a burden to people. They had made the law of God so burdensome, so difficult to obey, that they had now burdened the people. The people first of all, couldn't even figure out what the law was at times. What they could figure out, they couldn't keep. They had taken the laws of God that are given to direct, that were given to, to uh, enlighten the people, and they had made it a grievous and great burden. Now, instead of uh, seeing the law as, uh, well, the, uh, the Sabbath day is a day of rest, so we rest. And now it will come, well, you got to be careful. If you take more than so many steps, you've broken the Sabbath day. If you've uh, you know, done this and uh, you've broken the Sabbath day, they had taken the law and given and added so much to it that it was now impossible almost to even keep the law. And even the smallest of fashion. But the worst part of it was that not even the fact that they had taken and done these grievous burdens and then so burdened the, the law, but the fact was that they had done all of this, but, but they, they didn't even touch it themselves. They had taken this great standard of the law, uh, the, these great multiplied standards they had written out, and they had hammered them into the people, and they were forcing the people to obey them and to keep them. Yet, even, but yet they themselves were keeping them themselves. And they held the people to a high standard, a standard they didn't keep for themselves. That's how it is. But yet this essential element of false teaching is still very prevalent today. They had taken the law, they had taken the commandments of God, and turned them into burdens, and they had enslaved and ensnared the people. One of the big attributes, one of the big things that Christ promised, he says on numerous occasions, was what? He said that you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. What Christ promised, what the gospel promises till this day, is freedom. Freedom from the bondage of sin, freedom from the bondage of legalism, and all the ceremonialism 
that the law had become a day to Christ. Christ promised the people freedom, and yet the law promised the lawyers promised the people burdens. They promised bondage, uh, servitude. You're going to keep the law. You got to keep all of it. Uh, whereas Christ promised them freedom through grace, the law promised them bondage and hardship. Uh, this is something that not only Christ dealt with, but even the disciples throughout the early years of the church dealt with this issue. The, the need to, well, you're a saved child of God, but you've got to keep the law. Uh, you've got to obey the burdens and the, uh, all the stipulations of the law. You see a lot in Paul's epistles. So I had to tell people who say, well, look, you're a child of God, but now you've got to keep the Sabbath day. You've got to keep the uh, holy days. You've got to keep you know, circumcision. You've got to do all these burdens. Christ made us free. We are free indeed. But yet the false teachers said, no, uh, uh, you can't do that. Uh, you've got to add burdens upon you. You've got to add all the laws and stipulations. And they became burdens because all of a sudden, to the freedom of the gospel, you had burdens. Why? Because, well, think about it. Now it was, well, we're saved, but you know what? I got to be careful because you know, if I forget to keep the Sabbath day, or if I don't keep the Sabbath day right, you know, I've done, lost my salvation. You know, if I don't keep the right holy days, if I've not circumcised, if I've not obeyed every jot and tittle, then my salvation uh, isn't secured and I'm just not saved. That was the condition that so many of the first century Jewish believers who found themselves in, uh, that so many early Christians found themselves in because that's what they had been taught. Whereas they should have been living in the freedom of the gospel of Christ, uh, free from sin, free from legalism, free to serve the Lord, and yet instead they found themselves in the burden of captivity, the law of ritualism. Because that's what the people had taught. Well, as the Bible says, if the Son of Man makes you free, you'll be free indeed. That's why Paul taught and told the people, he said, that we were to continue in the freedom that was in Christ. If Christ has made you free, stand, therefore, in the freedom of Christ. So the book of Galatians speaks all about that. Still to this day, many of the false doctrines and many of the false teachings in our churches today are nothing more uh, than old examples of legalism and bondage and burdens. Uh, whereas the Bible says we're free, but yet the false doctrine, uh, the scribes of our day say, no, uh, there is no freedom, but you must keep all of these things. You see it in Catholicism. You see it uh, a great deal when you look at their doctrines and the fact that, well, if you don't, you know, you, you got to keep the sacraments. you got to keep all these commandments, all these things, because if you don't, you wind up in purgatory, and if you don't, or if you're lucky, and if not, then you'll go straight to hell, or however uh, all of those things play out in all of their burdens and all of the ritualism that they had. It's all the same thing. They don't call it uh, the law anymore. They don't call it the law of Moses, but it's the same basic principle you had in Jesus' day. It's uh, obey the law, keep the law, and if you don't, uh, you are condemning yourself. Well, it's not just Catholicism. You find it in pretty much every Protestant religion you come across. Uh, if you uh, don't attend church enough, you lose your salvation. If you don't keep the law good enough, you, well, they don't even call it the law anymore. That's, it. That's too uh, close to call it what it is. If you don't keep the Ten Commandments, if you don't obey the Word of God, if you have lost your salvation, you uh, lose these things. It's the same principle. It is taking the law, it is taking the word of God and put it, using it to place a, a slavery, to place a bondage upon the people. A bondage that they can't even keep. The simple fact of the matter is the word of God makes it very plain. If you can lose your salvation for sin, it'd be for any sin. And so if, if you uh, live that way, believe that way, then you're going to literally have to spend the rest of your life in fear and in bondage. Because you've got to the rest of your life wondering, and just in sheer fear, to make sure that you don't accidentally sin somewhere along the way and lose your salvation. Can you imagine that kind of bondage? Can you imagine the type of bondage and fear that is? Uh, that's what they require. If you truly today believe that you can lose your salvation for sin, then you're going to have to be asking for forgiveness every single time you sin, not just on Sunday, 
our whip today because if you die before you get the chance to ask for forgiveness, then you're going straight to hell because you sinned and you missed it. The Church of Christ, Cabalism, Protestantism, they put their people into a state of bondage that they don't even acknowledge truly is what it is. But it's there. False doctrine that leads to grievous burdens so heavy, so hard that the leaders don't even try to keep it themselves. I thank God today that we have been set free by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm not uh, saved by works. I'm not kept by works. Uh, Works-based salvation, work-based keeping in salvation. is nothing more than legalism and burdens that are so hard, so grievous, that you couldn't keep it even if you wanted to. That's why Jesus rebuked the scribes and rebuked the lawyers here is because they have made all these uh, burdens and stipulations. It was impossible to keep them anyway. And they had so overburdened the people that the people had lost sight of the word. But Christ, he rebuked the scribes, these lawyers here, for their uh, unequal interpretation and application of the law, but also rebuked them because of their false reverence for the word. You know, these men had taken and placed all these great burdens created all of that effort. What did they claim? They said, we, we love the word of God. We love God's word. We love God's prophets. And we exalt them. They had taken the time to build these sepulchers, to build all these things, all, all these great prophets of God. They said, you know, we, we love God's word so much. And we love those who proclaim it. We love those who are taking the time to teach the word of God as you proclaim it. Jesus said, you know what? Your forefathers hated the prophets, at least the true prophets anyway, because they called out their sin. You, know, you go back throughout the Old Testament, there were always the prophets that God sent that called the people's sin out, who made their sin known. They were generally the ones that everybody hated. They got thrown in the pit like Jeremiah, who got sawn and sundered, uh, and who were being persecuted. The prophets that everybody loved were generally the ones that taught whatever false doctrine people loved, whatever uh, caught their fancy. Uh, true prophets of God called out and said, you're going to spend 70 years in Babylon in captivity. Uh, judgment's coming. Be prepared. The false prophets were the ones who said, God's not going to judge Josh. They were the ones that everybody listened to. They were also the ones proven wrong. Yes, the scribe, the lawyers of Jesus' day, they made all the sepulchers, they made all the, the claims, they made all the, the rights. So look how much we love the prophets. Look how much we love God's word. We love God's prophets. When in actuality, they were just as guilty as people of, of the Old Testament times because they were just as responsible for their death, just as responsible uh, for their persecution. Uh, in fact, Jesus said that the blood from Abel all the way to Zacharias uh, uh, would be required of this particular generation. Now, of course, Abel, we know that story. That's the one that uh, or Cain killed Abel uh, there back in the early days of Genesis. Uh, but Zacharias was the prophet that was slain in the latter part uh, of Second Chronicles. Now, what's important to understand there is that in the Jewish Canaan of Christ's day, that is the Jewish order of Old Testament books, Second Chronicles was the last book in their Bible, so to speak. And so literally when he says from Abel to Zacharias, that literally encompasses the entirety of the Old Testament. And so it's literally all the prophets. Okay? When he says Abel to Zacharias, that was the first person slain and the last person slain in the Old Testament. Okay? And it is all of the Old Testament saints. All of them. Were they required of them? Because all the prophets spoke of I look forward to the Jesus who stayed before them. And uh, Jesus said that God is in the prophets and apostles, verse 49, and they had persecuted and killed them. Every prophet in the Old Testament times that uh, the uh, people had taken and slain and persecuted, the scribes had said, uh, well, we'll revere them, men like Isaiah and Jeremiah. Well, they had spoken in said that Christ was coming when Christ was standing right before them. God said he sent this generation prophets and apostles and he did. And they had the apostles of uh, their walking with Christ right there. 
uh, they may not have been fully, uh, fully learned yet. They, you find that it won't be until the book of Acts that they start, and after the resurrection, they really understand everything, but they have the apostles. And yet they persecuted them, they slew them, as many of them as they could. The scribes of Jesus' day were just as guilty of rejecting the prophet's message as the people in the days of Isaiah. Uh, they were just as guilty because they rejected the message of Jesus. They rejected the message of Peter and Matthew and uh, all the other apostles. They were just as guilty. Oh, they put on the show. Uh, just like the day people in the Old Testament did. Uh, they took the prophets they liked. They made it look like they were religious. They made it look like they were great, uh, great men of God. But yet in actuality, the hearts were far from it. And even though they claimed to be worshiping God, they were rejecting the message that God had given them. You see, in these lawyers, they had gotten to the point where they had taken the word of God. They turned it into a burden for the people. They had taken their reference for the word of God made it a, a show, made it something that anybody could look to and admire them for, when in actuality they had rejected the word of God. They had turned the law into burdens and they had rejected the prophets that were before them. I assure you today that there are still many in God's churches today, there are still many of God's people today who are rejecting the truth of the word of God for something far more convenient and far more uh, beneficial to them. They're willing to take and to uh, claim a, a love for the Word of God. Many today are willing to take and to claim a, a love and a devotion for God's Word and for God's uh, prophets, for those who claim the Word of God, but in reality they despise it and they have rejected it. Because when men stand and proclaim the truth, they reject it and they do anything they can to ignore it and to do away with it. We may not have the same lawyers of Jesus' day, but we have men who live the exact same life. They claim a reverence for God's word, but in reality they reject God's word. It happens a great many times. Men today will stand up and proclaim, well, we love Jesus. We, uh, we love his word. They claim religious adherence, but they reject it. You see, it's a great deal. Uh, in the political circles, political realm of our day, men who stand up and say, well, I'm a Christian. I, I love God's word. I go to church. I attend uh, mass. I do all these things right. But they reject the word of God. You can see it because their lives don't match up with what they say. And they claim adherence. But yet they adhere to teachings. That they promote things that are far from it. Uh, there is something wrong with uh, a man who can say he, he loves the Lord and he teaches God's word, but yet he stands politically behind uh, abortion. He stands politically behind uh, whatever it is, the modern day vernacular, LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus uh, transgenderism. I can't even keep up with all the acronyms anymore. There's so many uh, stipulations in there. There's something wrong when one claims adherence to the word of God, claims to love God's word, but yet stands uh, actively, uh, just vigorously behind things that God's words rebukes time and time again. There's nothing wrong with the heart. But that's what the Bible says, what they were doing in Jesus' day. They claimed their religion. They claimed their, uh, their stamp of approval from their religious rights. But when it came to actually standing for the word of God, their hearts, their lives were far, far from it. But it's not just politicians in our day. It's all across the board. Uh, men who will claim to be Christian, men who will claim to, to love the Word of God. They don't go to church. There's your first time trouble right there. Uh, they claim to be the, to love the Lord. They claim His doctrine, yet they reject the Word of God because they don't go to church. They don't attend His church. They don't strive to learn from His Word. They don't strive to live for Him. They claim to be Christian, but yet their lives are so far off base. They are truly hard. Men who claim to be one thing, but in reality are not. What Jesus said in the first verse of that chapter is hypocrites. How sad it is that some things have not changed. Many today will still claim to be the religious elite who will claim to, to love the Lord, and claim to love his word, and yet will live their lives so far away from it. Solomon 
said some that uh, there's nothing new under the sun, and unfortunately, that's also true of the way that men act. Many today will uh, make the law and make the word of God burden so the people can't keep it. Many today will claim to love the Lord and claim to love his word. And yet, in reality, they will reject it. They are just as guilty as the scribes were in Christ's day. If today you truly love the word of God, if today you truly love uh, his word as you seek to keep it, listen to it. If you love the word of God today, if you love God today, listen to his word and keep it and follow it. That's what Christ was rebuking the liars for, was the fact that they claimed to love it, but in reality, they rejected it. And they said, we love the word of God, but we reject it. Don't reject the word of God today. If you today truly love the Lord, then live for him. If you truly love him today, keep his word. Obey his word. Do what the scribes failed to do. Obey what God has put forward. The third and final one that he gave them there in verse 52 was perhaps in some ways the saddest, but also was one of the greatest errors that they had. The lawyers had the key of knowledge. It says they had taken away, he said, you, when you have taken away the key of knowledge, you enter not in yourselves, and then they're entering in, you hinder. The lawyers had in their hands, literally, the word of God. They had within their hand the word that God inspired, the word that God gave to the prophets, the word that God gave unto them. They had everything they needed to look at Jesus Christ, to understand that he was exactly who he said he was, and yet they refused to accept it. They had the key of knowledge, but yet they refused to enter in. They had everything they needed to know. They had everything they needed to believe in God and to accept Christ and to live for Him. And yet they took the key of knowledge they had given the whole lives to understanding, supposedly, and they shut it off and they rejected it. They had what they needed, yet they refused to take that key and to use it and to enter in and to receive eternal life. How sad that it is. How many today will have within their grasp, will have in their hands the key of knowledge, who will have the word of God right before them, who will uh, have the ability to read it and to understand it, and who will read it and who will then turn a uh, blind eye and a deaf ear to the word of God and say, Lord, I hear it, but I don't want to believe it because it interferes with fill in the blank. And it interferes with my life, my job, my career, my family. And people come with all things they can fill in the blank. But they will read the word of God and they'll make the conscious decision to reject it and to walk away. How sad that men have not changed from that accounting. Many today still hear but refuse to listen. But even worse than that was the fact that not only had these scribes made the decision and made the choice to reject it themselves but those who were entering in they hindered these men had gotten to the point where not only had they made the decision to reject it themselves but now they saw others who were entering in and they were hindering them they saw men who may have been convicted they saw men who perhaps were convicted and genuinely interested and learning about the gospel, learning about Christ, and they were hindering them from doing so. Not only had they rejected Christ, but they were keeping others from accepting him as well. This is essentially the same rebuke uh, that he gave to the Pharisees in verse 44. We looked at last week when he told them, uh, he warned them about the things that they were doing, that they were keeping men from listening, from heeding. The Pharisees' attitude, characteristics, and the way they lived their lives were keeping many from accepting Christ. The lawyers, the way they had interpreted the word of God, the way that they were living the word of God, was hindering and keeping many from accepting and following Christ. Yes, it was sad that they were rejecting Christ, but even more burdensome, even more grievous than that, was that not only were they rejecting what was right before them, but that they were keeping others from accepting him as well. 
You know, as a child of God today, we must be very careful that when we claim to be a child of God, that we live the way we should, and that we teach the Word of God the way it's supposed to be taught. Because others see, others hear, and others know. And we do not want to be the child of God who is the reason why someone rejects Christ, but be the reason why someone refuses to receive Christ, because they look at us and say, well, if the gospel is what uh, he has, I don't want that. <laughs> well, if that, being a Christian is going to make me live like that guy, I don't, I don't want that. Uh, we should not be the hypocrites that keep people away from accepting Christ. We should make certain, we should be careful uh, to the utmost of our abilities that our lives are such that point others to Christ, to help others to see their need to accept him uh, and to live for him. The scribes and the Pharisees, they were slightly different, perhaps some of their errors in the end, it was the same thing. They had rejected Christ and they were keeping others and they were making it hard for others to accept him as well. Today, as a child of God, today, if you're not a child of God, when the word of God convicts you, you must hear to it and you need to yield to it. But today is the only day you have because tomorrow, you're not promised tomorrow. There may not be a tomorrow. But if you have never accepted Christ as your Savior, this warning tells us that you'd better accept Him now uh, and not hold back. If you're a child of God, don't uh, live your life in such a way that keeps people from accepting Him, but uh, to drive people to Christ and help them to see their need to accept Him and to live for Him. Uh, the scribes and lawyers of Christ's day, they claimed to be the great interpreters of the law. Uh, they made their claim to being the religious group that understood, who taught the people the way the Word of God should be. They loved the Word of God after all. But yet in reality, they had taken the Word of God, they had made it a burden that the people couldn't keep. And uh, they had made it so grievous that no one could do it. Yet Christ offers freedom. Today, don't allow the false doctrines of our day to burden you beyond what you can bear. But enjoy the freedom of Christ and live for him who loves you and who died for you. Do not claim today to love the word of God and yet reject his teachings. Do not claim to be those who love the Lord, who love his word, and yet uh, reject what it says. Just like the scribes have rejected and claimed to love the Lord, but yet rejected his prophets, rejected his word. Yes, if you love the Lord today, if you love his word, live by his word, accept what it says. And today, if you are uh, if a child of God, if you are one who has accepted Christ, to live like it. But if you are one today who has never made a decision, who has never made a choice to repent of your sin and place your faith in Christ, if today you have read the Word of God, if today you've heard the Word of God, and you understand what Christ, who Christ is, and what He has done, then accept Him today. Don't possess within you, don't have within your hands the key of knowledge. Don't have within your hands the gospel of Christ. And decide to reject it and set it down and walk away. Don't make that choice. And instead, take the Word of God. Take that key of knowledge and accept Christ, repent of your sins, and trust in Him today. Don't read the gospel and walk the other direction. Read the gospel and accept it. And allow Christ to be your Savior today. And if you make that decision uh, to accept Christ, lead others to that cause. And uh, don't be those who lead others away from the Lord. Yes, the lawyers were rebuked because they had distorted, and they had misinterpreted, misapplied. The word of God. And we must be careful today not to fall into their same errors, into their same problems. But we must be careful uh, to love the word of God and to live by the word of God. And be careful to live in the freedom that God has given to us, but also to live in that freedom in a way that is honoring the Lord and that leads others uh, to Him. And you will have a word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, Lord, we bow before you, and Father, we thank you so much for the day. Thank you for the wonderful blessing that you bestowed upon us and our ability to simply come to listen to your word. Father, we know that your word is our, 
our guide. It's our direction. Father, help us to take the time not only to read the Word of God, but also to yield to it and allow it to shape our lives, that our lives might truly be pleasing to you, that others might see you through us and have a desire to come to know you and to love you as well. But Father, it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. If you will stand, and we'll have just a verse of invitation this morning. If you're here and you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, all that you have to do is to uh, repent of your sins and place your faith in Him, and He will save you. But if you are here as a child of God, perhaps you have a fellowship with Him, perhaps you have some burdens, the need you to lay before the Lord, whatever that is, we come and sing just a, a verse of invitation this morning. Number one twenty. One twenty. So I forgot to remind everybody about that. Please, not like I said I would. So if you have something we can do that this morning, if not, we can take it up again tonight. As well, we have until next Sunday before we're here. So we'll do that as we're able to. Is there anything else before we dismiss? Yeah, anybody, Daniel, dismiss us in prayer, please. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your time.